Good afternoon, colleagues. We will but get started, if that's okay. Um, welcome, everybody, to the March GFM talk session. Before we start, just a reminder of why we come together for the GFM talks. It's an opportunity for colleagues across the GFM and other schools to come together to talk about um, things that they're working on in a professional context, um, to talk about practice, experience, thoughts uh, within our educational context. We have one speaker this afternoon, uh, Nigel Mathias, head teacher from Bayhouse School in Sitcall, who is going to talk to us about narrative as a machine to think with. And we're going to start with some feedback, I believe, after Nigel from the um, pre session think question. So I'll pass over to I'll pass over to Nigel. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'm conscious of the fact that I might have put a few people off this with the title. I don't think it was the snappiest title uh, that uh, I could have come up with. Uh, but it's not actually my words, it's actually a, uh, it's actually a quote. But we'll come to that um, in a second. But the idea about narrative or about stories is something that's going to kind of underpin this and sort of uh, hopefully be the sort of writing through the rock through, through this session. But I wanted people to start by thinking about a question. Um, and the question was about how we know uh, whether or not uh, we've been um, successful with the youngsters that we teach, with departments that we're attached to um, in the school that we work in. How do we measure success? Now, if you've worked with me in the last five or six years, at least, you probably would expect me to be saying something about numbers or something about exam results here because that has been my professional identity for quite a long time. I started off uh, in senior leadership as a person who was looking at exam results. My job title was raising standards leader. I was very much looking at um, examination performance and a lot of my job was to do with numbers. And of course, I'm not going to stand here and say to you that that isn't an important way of measuring success. Um, of course, it's one of the, the kind of key methods that we would use um, as practitioners to measure or not whether we've been successful. But I'm going to argue, I suppose, over the next sort of 20 minutes, half an hour, um, that actually that isn't the only or necessarily even the best way of measuring success uh, when you're working with individual pupils, with youngsters, or in a whole school context um, as well. So just to take some feedback from, uh, from you all to start off with then, uh, what kind of things did you come up with? Can I start with this group over here, Luke? Yes, um, student or parent was. Okay, so getting, getting feedback from pupils, getting feedback from parents, so that encompasses a whole range and a broad range of techniques. Um, we were talking about our well-being curriculum and how to can verbalise their understanding emotions and talk through their problems and um, be happier at school and want to come to school they would say that they've been successful. So pupil expression of their own experience and emotions is quite an interesting idea and that's one that we'll, we'll come back to in a bit. Helen, did you have a chance to discuss this in your group? Um, we talked about happiness and again feedback. Um, there's, there's also sharing a quote from a play, I haven't got it, and it says the most important things in life are immeasurable. So we talked about you know, how do you measure kindness and, and the sort of human qualities, um, which makes it slightly more. We talk about what you said about data, you can't actually measure them in a quantifiable way. Well, we'll talk about measurement in, in a minute and, and where that kind of comes in, because I think that's quite sort of pertinent to this discussion, actually. And there are ways of measuring things, of course, that have uh, nothing to do with numbers, and we'll sort of have a look at that in a second. Um, Georgina, did you have anything on your mind? We will talk about knowledge yep. as one, well, and application of knowledge in different contexts. Okay, interesting. Knowledge is also going to be an important part of this discussion as well. Ian, I know you've just walked in, but you're in group at the back. Oh, we're thinking yeah. about assessment against a set of criteria. Yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, how those, how that criteria matched up against uh, values and priorities. Well, it's an interesting one when you're talking about setting assessment criteria in advance and, and the extent to which that you kind of accomplish those things. So we've gone through uh, quite an interesting time in the last sort of six, seven years with this because we had an education secretary, Michael Gove, um, who quite sort of publicly talked about the fact that um, he didn't have a problem with teaching to the test as long as it was the right test. Uh, and then we had <laughs> teachers quite often lamenting the fact that we were asked to teach to the test um, a lot of the time. So it's quite a controversial one that actually in terms of sort of setting criteria in advance and, and working towards it. Um, okay, um, hopefully you'll see the sort of pertinence or relevance of this um, as, as we sort of move on. 
Um, I wanted to explain the, the background um, to this and the reason that I have an interest in it. I've always found, or certainly in the last five or six years, that I've, I've had this kind of difficult um, sort of challenge in terms of my own professional identity because I've been somebody who has principally worked with numbers and performance and yet my background was that of a teacher of English and a teacher of English literature specifically and the thing that had always fascinated me going through the education system was stories, uh, telling stories um, and understanding stories and yet I found myself in a job where I was looking at something quite different um, and I've always found that to be a challenge because I've never really left behind the fascination about stories and their construction. So when I got a chance a number of years ago um, to study for a PhD at, at Southampton University, um, I decided that I wanted to kind of revisit my roots. I wanted to go back to the thing that interested me when I first became a teacher, which was the idea of narrative study. Um, and this was a bit of a challenge in a number of ways, because I bet, you see, um, this was a challenge in a number of ways because I kind of moved into quite a different field of my profession. So I started going back in and revisiting things that I looked at and studied a number of years before. And so I started to sort of put together ideas from different areas and different fields. I wanted to start off with something uh, interactive. Now, I'm, I'm guessing that Yvette might know the answer to this straight away, but other, that's a clue, okay, but other people might not. Um, I wanted to start off with a little bit of work about definition, okay, um, and the definition of narrative and the definition of story. But before we get to that, can I just give you a little exercise to do? Um, so there's a couple of key images on the board here. Some of you will hopefully will recognise, some that you might not. Can I just give you a little task in your group? Can you tell me what links those images for me, please? I'll just give you one minute to do so. What links Does anyone want to take a guess at what links these images? Or anyone recognise any of the images to start with? Dean? Why are they all these various of Romeo and Juliet? Well, Romeo and Juliet is a, a, a factor here, yes. So, uh, anyone recognise this one at the top here? So, this is Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet from 1996, very, very popular edition of, of the text. This one here, I'm sure Yvette would recognise that one. It's, it's from Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet, probably considered to be the two most definitive versions on film um, of the text. Um, much more modern production, some of you might recognise David Tennant here. Um, and this is a, a, a far earlier Hollywood production of Romeo and Juliet, but from the 1930s. Anyone recognise this? Is Titchfield Abbey? Yeah. It is Titchfield Abbey. Does anyone have any ideas why it's there? Go on. Is that the Yes, according to, um, according to a lot of the historical accounts of the early productions of Romeo and Juliet, the first recorded performance of Romeo and Juliet took place at Titchfield Abbey, although no one is absolutely 100% certain. My guess is, though, that no one knows who this is. Does anyone want to have a guess? Which could you put? Sorry? Chap on the far left. Yeah, this chap here. Anyone know who he is? Is it Marlowe? Is it Mark Marlowe? I'll be honest, I wouldn't recognise him either unless I'd, look, I'd looked it up beforehand. This is a guy called Matteo Bandella. Now, why is he important? He's important because he came up with the story of Romeo and Juliet. Shakespeare didn't write the story. Right, Shakespeare didn't come up with the story. In fact, we're not even entirely sure if Matteo Bandello did. The story existed for ages before Shakespeare got anywhere near it. There was all kinds of different versions. It existed as poetry, uh, it existed as a, as a folk tale. It was only when Shakespeare put it on the stage that it became popularised. Okay? And I suppose this is uh, my first illustration of the difference between story and narrative. 
narrative is about the way in which a story is told and not just the story itself. Now, I would argue that had Shakespeare not committed it to the stage, that perhaps we wouldn't still be talking about it. All of these images show that um, this text is, is uh, resuscitated, it's brought back to life with every subsequent performance. And yet that wouldn't necessarily have happened had the narrative not been strong in the first instance. Now, I think this is important when we are looking at how we understand the pupil experience. And I'll try and tie these things together in, in, in a moment. Now, there are lots of narrative theorists or narratologists that talk about the way that we use narrative to try and understand the experience. Now, for me, as an English teacher, I've always been interested um, in narrative, in, in understanding the <coughs> stories and the way that they're told. And narratologists argue that in doing so, the reason that we tell stories or explore stories is that we are searching for equilibrium. It means that we're kind of trying to understand something about our own lives. And I recognise this in myself. When I became a teacher, when I was trying to explain things in the classroom, I quite often rely on anecdotes. I tell stories to try and, uh, as, as a hook to try and interest the youngsters in my classroom. I was always interested um, in that idea. And this is where the idea of narrative as a machine to think with comes from. If we're trying to understand an experience, you can understand an experience um, in a more complex, in a deeper, more thorough way, I would contend, if you do it through the lens of narrative. Now, there is a complexity here, because as I've just explained with Romeo and Juliet, the Romeo and Juliet example, story and narrative are not necessarily the same thing. Okay? And I'm going to try and illustrate that with a couple of examples in a minute. <coughs> But before we get there, um, I'm just going to talk about something a little bit more complicated. Now, um, I'm sure that Stacey from Social Science here would, would know all about this stuff. But before we get to this, um, before we get to the idea about using narrative as a research method, we kind of have to come overcome a couple of hurdles. Now, if anyone ever chooses to go and do a master's degree, or certainly if they go on to do a PhD, one of the first things that you do is you have to do a module in the philosophy of education. I found it the most incredibly difficult and challenging thing that, that I think I did in, in terms of the whole um, course. Um, and really, there are a couple of kind of hurdles that you need to overcome before you start your study. Now, my study was um, a, a qualitative study. It wasn't quantitative in nature. Um, but before you even got to the method, you needed to decide on your ontological and your epistemological position. Okay, so if I can just try and explain very briefly what the difference is. So first of all, ontology um, is this philosophical field which revolves around the, the study of um, the nature of reality um, and its, its very existence. And beyond that is something called epistemology, which is the field um, of the study of knowledge and how you reach it and how you understand it. Now, this is quite complex because there are a whole series, a whole raft of different epistemological positions that you can take. There are two main branches of epistemology, which are interpretivism and positivism. I'll talk about those a little bit more in a second. But you have to decide what your philosophical position is before you get to your methodology. The easiest way of explaining this really is this. The positivist position um, is that the world is governed by rules and cause and effect. Positivists believe that pretty much everything can be measured and that everything can be understood as a chain of causal events and that there is a definitive truth that you can find. If you are a positivist scientist, then you are probably going to use quantitative methods in your study because it fits with your philosophical position. That's not always true, but it's mostly true. If you are an interpretivist and you have an interpretivist epistemological position, then your methodology is more likely to be qualitative. Um, it may surprise you, if you've worked with me for a number of years, and heard me talking about spreadsheets, that my position, I genuinely believe, is an interpretivist position, and I'm more drawn to quanti uh, qualitative sorry, methodological approaches. So, if you would believe that narrative study and narrative interpretation um, is of value, then you're probably coming at that from an interpretative paradigm. Okay, so what this does is it questions the assumptions of positivism. 
it questions that there is one definitive truth. If you're an interpretivist, you believe that society places too much emphasis on science and technology, that the world uh, <coughs> isn't a rational, ordered place, there isn't a defined past, present and future, um, that actually it's far, far more complex than that. And it stresses the importance um, of the individual, symbolic and subjective experience. Now what's of real interest to me is that when I was studying at university, one of my supervisors, one of my tutors, was a chap called Professor Daniel Muge, who was a quantitative, positivist lecturer. Everything that he did was about numbers and about measurement. And since um, I worked with him, he's gone on to be uh, head of research at Ofsted, and he's completely changed his position. And uh, he's now devised an Ofsted framework which is based entirely, pretty much, on this position, which I've never have seen coming. But it does show you that people can change their position when it comes um, to epistemology, uh, epistemological approaches and methodology. Um, I'm going to come back to this, if that's OK, and change the order a little bit, just before we, we, we sort of get, we get to this. Um, I just want to, before we go into an actual example, look at, again, this idea about the difference between narrative um, and story. When I was looking at um, how you evaluate the pupil experience, um, and sort of riffing on this idea that I've just talked about, about the interpretivist paradigm, understanding the individual experience, there are a whole series of methods that are available to you. So if you want to go into your school or your department or your class and find out about the pupil experience, and you want to do that in an interpretivist way, there are a whole series of methods you can use. The most obvious one is interviews. You can interview pupils, or you can run focus groups, or you can do questionnaires with open-ended answers. And that's a, a kind of methodological approach that you can take that will give you qualitative data. But I wanted to do something a little bit different. I can best explain it to you like this. Um, as a student of, of English and a teacher of English, I was always interested in deconstructing texts. I mentioned Romeo and Juliet earlier, and the reason that I use that as an example is, I don't know how many of you have seen Romeo and Juliet or ever read it, I think Romeo and Juliet is probably Shakespeare's worst play. I think it's incredibly boring. The, the uh, plot is very, very simple. All right, it's quite rock and roll, it's only a week long and everyone dies at the end, but it's not particularly interesting. But the way it is performed on stage can sometimes turn something that's quite dry and quite basic into something quite complex. And I think the ways that stories are told is sometimes quite different from the story itself. I'm going to use a much more um, sort of uh, up-to-date example, if you don't mind. Does anyone recognise this still? Anyone know this film? Reservoir Dogs. It's not Reservoir Dogs, but you are close. Oh, Pulp Fiction. Fiction. It's Pulp Fiction. Okay. Can I just have a show of hands? How many of you have seen Pulp Fiction? Okay. Pretty good, two thirds. If you haven't seen Pop Fiction, go and watch it tonight. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a brilliant film. Um, anyone remember this, the, these characters' names? These two characters' names? Mr. Black. Wrong film. No, I'm thinking of Reservoir Dogs. You are, right? yeah. So this is this is Pumpkin. Uh, this is Pumpkin. This is Honey Bunny. Okay, that's their nicknames in this scene. Does anyone remember the nature of the scene? the opening scene of the film. Correct. So what, what's happening here is that at the beginning of the scene, Pumpkin and Honey Bunny are talking about robberies. Uh, and they're talking about robbing liquor stores. And they have a conversation about whether or not it's worth it because it's becoming increasingly dangerous to do so. And then they decide that actually the, the future, instead of robbing liquor stores, is either to go back to robbing banks or, and then one of them has the idea about robbing a restaurant. Okay, and they're in the restaurant and they're discussing the robbery. Now, Dean picked up on something. What did you say when I asked you a second ago? What's happening? Uh, Daniel Jackson talking about. Right, except that doesn't happen in this scene, but it's interesting that's the thing that you've remembered. Now, what happens is halfway through this conversation, this is the opening scene of the film, you see a very, very brief shot of the back of John Travolta's head as he walks across. Um, the restaurant, and you hear the words of Samuel L. Jackson in a conversation that you don't get to hear about for another 93 minutes in the film, okay? Because this scene, chronologically, does not happen at the start of the story, 
but it does happen at the start of the film because the film is not in chronological order. You see this scene in which they talk about the robbery, but you don't get to see the robbery till much, much, much later. Now, this is something called a Gothic composition. It means that as a viewer, you have to start piecing it together. Not all the answers are there for you. It's not necessarily in the right order. Now, I would contend that when you ask pupils about their experience in your classroom, or in this, or, or in your school, you won't necessarily get things in the precise, right, logical order. You have to have some degree of ergodic composition, both on their part, in terms of the way they tell the story, and on your part, in terms of the way that you interpret the story. Now, what's interesting, just picking up on, on the fact that Dean remembered a different part of the film, <coughs> is I suspect that's to do with this. In the social sciences, generally, when you perform interviews to elicit narratives from people, most social science theorists will talk about epiphanies. So they'll talk about kind of clear events that take place in people's lives in narrative theory. But my study was a little bit different. I didn't look at epiphanies necessarily, but I looked at something which is actually from the world of literary study rather than from the social sciences. I looked at this idea um, of kernels and satellites. Now, what this means is that when you're telling your story, when you're um, <coughs> delivering your narrative, if you like, um, that you will look at a series of events that have taken place in your life. Now, some of those events will be kernel events. They are the constituent events that are essential in the advancement of the story. You can't move on to the next bit without the kernel event. And some events will be satellite events, they'll be supplementary, they might <coughs> appear to be extra, they might appear to be superfluous, not important. But as a researcher, you have to ask the question, in my view, about if you ask somebody to tell you their life story, and they include what they consider to be, or on first glance are, superfluous satellite events, then why are they there? And sometimes they can tell an entirely different story and a quite complex story as well. I'm going to get you to do um, a little bit of a, a task for me um, in a second. Um, but before we do, I just want you to sort of a, a explain that, that sort of point again, just in a little bit more detail. What I was interested in is that when we ask pupils about their experiences in school, in subjects, in classes, perhaps over a longer period of time, we tend to focus on the story and not the narrative. What I mean by that is we listen to the content of what they say, but not the way that they say it. Well, this never made sense to me. If you're a student of literature, you're not always that interested in the story. You're more interested in the way that the story is told. Because it's far, far more interesting. And I believe that the same thing can be true of pupils' narrative experience. So rather than just hearing their story, actually looking at the way they tell their story can be more illuminating in terms of understanding the pupil experience. Now, if you're conducting narrative interviews, and you, you can talk about this for hours and hours and hours, and I'm doing this very, very quickly, most of the literature, and Van Graaff is one of the, the, the people who's kind of central to this, revolves around the idea of something called a squin. Okay? As an aside, the word squinny only exists in the Portsmouth Peninsula. I don't know if you know this. It's a Portsmouth-based word, if you're interested in, in, in that kind of thing. But it's nothing to do with that. In this case, squin stands uh, for single question aimed at inducing narrative. Narrative interviews are completely different <coughs> from conventional social science interviews in that you only ever ask one question. You ask the question at the beginning, and then you try to say as little as you possibly can. Now, there are a whole series of rules about narrative interviews, and you can say things afterwards, but you can only speak using the language of your interviewee. So if they mention something, you can ask further questions using their language. But the idea is that you have an open-ended question. The reality of performing uh, narrative interviews is that it can be incredibly uncomfortable, because there can be lots of silences at the beginning and you have to let people go. And you have to be careful not to fill the vacuum and fill the void. But this was exactly what I did. Um, I asked um, a, a whole series of people that took part in the study. Today's not about 
the data in terms of what I found out. It's more about the method. But I asked people to tell me the story of their life in education, and all kinds of things came out. And to tell you the, the sample of students that, are, that I worked with, I had one particular student um, who uh, told me about her life in education, which actually culminated in her going on to study at, at, at Cambridge and, all, and her experience all the way through her academic life. And, I, and equally and tragically, I had another person who I did a narrative interview with um, who suffered from terrible depression and attempted suicide. And it made the ethics of capturing their experiences in education really, really challenging. But in asking this question, and it is only one question, it elicited so much information, which I then used, um, not just in terms of the content of what they said, but in terms of the method that they used to tell that story. I actually worked with four students um, over quite a long period of time doing a series of narrative interviews. I'm still in touch with all of them. And I can't tell you any of them are because of the sensitive nature of the data, but occasionally they still write to me and things, and they're off doing all kinds of stuff now as, as, as adults. But it was a really kind of wonderful thing. But your relationship as uh, a researcher that you have with your, uh, with your data is really complex and sometimes quite moving, can be exhilarating, can be harrowing as well. You're not going to get out of this without doing a little task, okay? So, uh, on the tables in front of you, um, I have put some pieces of paper. If you haven't got one of these, there are some more around, which has got a little, uh, um, a little sheet, which, here we go, thank you. A sheet which has got some squares and some circles on it. Um, this is a bit of a sort of preparation task, really. Now, we're not going to have a chance to, sorry, can you pop up your hand if you haven't got one? Um, we're not going to have a chance to do a full narrative interview now, but I'm going to ask you to imagine that you found yourself in this scenario. If a researcher was interviewing you now, has got one, thank you. If a researcher was interviewing you now, and they posed to you this question, please tell me the story of your life in education, all the events and experiences that, uh, that have been important to you personally, how it all happened, begin wherever you like. I won't interrupt, I'll just take some notes for afterwards. Whenever I did one of these interviews, without exception, people always said, can I have a few minutes just to make some notes first? Okay? I'm going to give you a few minutes to make your notes. Okay? Can we stop filming?